and help us see more clearly what the future holds. Dr. Fauci has been the leading public health voice during the COVID-19 pandemic and is the chief medical advisor to President Joe Biden. During his career, Dr. Fauci has led the federal response to all major disease outbreaks over the last 40 years, including HIV AIDS, Ebola, SARS, MERS, Zika, and anthrax. He is also an architect of one of the most successful disease prevention programs in the world, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, a program that addresses the global HIV AIDS epidemic. Begun in 2003 under President George W. Bush, PEPFAR is estimated to have saved the lives of 21 million people. Like Dr. Fauci's three daughters, I too grew up as a child of an infectious disease specialist and epidemiologist. I'm sure we can all swap dinners about what dinner swap stories about what dinner conversations were like growing up in our houses. But unlike a few of those dinner conversations growing up, I very much look forward to Dr. Fauci's insight as we continue to navigate our lives in this long pandemic. Dr. Fauci, thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jen. It's really good to be with you all. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, some minutes talking about some of the lessons that we've learned from COVID-19 in our pandemic preparedness and response. And then uh, hopefully we'll have the opportunity to entertain questions from the group. So just to put things in perspective, we know now we're about two and a half years into the pandemic, which was first recognized in the first days of January 2020 of cases of an unusual pneumonia that were identified now retrospectively likely in December or earlier of 2019 in the central region of China called Wuhan. If you now fast forward to where we are today and look at the global pandemic and look at cases per 100,000, and you can see that in the color code of the density throughout the world. Now we have about 508 million cases and more than 6 million deaths. The death count is likely considerably underestimated and the number is likely more than that. So here are some of the lessons that I'll very quickly buzz through making comments on each of them, but really just to stimulate discussion. First is the global information, information sharing and the collaborations which are absolutely essential to any adequate response or preparation for a global pandemic. So here we have schematically diagrammed the kinds of things that one does, namely to share research reagents, real world clinical data, viral isolates, genomic data,
Vaccine Research Center. And what it means is that you take a particular category of pathogens, a family, and you build on prior experiences with that family of pathogens. And these are some of the families that are on the high priority list. The one that are obviously most familiar is the coronaviruses, which gave us SARS-1, MERS, and now SARS-CoV-2. The orthomyxoviruses, which are the different influenzas. The flaviviruses, which is West Nile and dengue and others. And what you do is that you take commonalities within a family, such as basic virology, assays, animal models, antigenic targets, vaccine platforms, correlates of immunity, as well as manufacturing strategies, and you develop it for one of those so-called prototype pathogens, and you find there are many similarities within that that allow you to jump ahead when you get a new pathogen within that family. The same exact way when SARS-CoV-2 came along, our experience in 2002 with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS in 2012 allowed us to move extremely rapidly. Next, the continued surveillance of the human-animal interface is absolutely critical. 75% of all new pathogens are zoonotic, namely pathogens that infect humans, 75% of them that are new come from an animal host. And in fact, my colleague and I, David Morens, wrote last year in Cell that the imbalance of the interactions in the animal-human interface are a major component of outbreaks, be it influenza, Ebola, coronavirus, or what have you. Namely, the human health clearly is connected to the health of animals, as we've seen in so many outbreaks. Some recent example is now mounting evidence that the cause of SARS-CoV-2 outbreak was the result of a jumping of species from an animal to a human, similar to SARS-CoV-1, which went from a bat to a civet cat to a human, and mares, which went from a bat to a camel to a human. That is still, although we don't know precisely what the origin is, it is very likely that that is the case, despite the fact that the lab leak hypothesis still obviously has not been disproven. Next, longstanding systemic health and social inequities that we see are driving pandemic disparities. We've seen it with virtually every disease. Again, this has been written about recently that the most pervasive disparities are seen among our minority populations. African Americans, Latino, and where we have data, also American Indian, Alaskan Natives, and Pacific Islanders. Why is that the case? Why do we see such disparities? Well, the answer to that has been obvious for decades. The underlying discrimination and the results of longstanding racism has led to a disadvantage that minorities have been put at by limited healthcare access and use by some of their occupations, which disproportionately put them in essential work settings, as opposed to the easy ability to work remotely the way many people are able to do. There are educational income and wealth gaps, housing issues where some people live in crowded conditions, and it's hard to follow prevention strategies. And finally, what about misinformation? We are seeing a heavy dose of that in the current pandemic. And here are some of the crazy examples of what we have to deal with when the common enemy unquestionably is the virus. And these are some of the things that all you know. Bill Gates and I putting microchips in the vaccines that might actually make somebody magnetic, not to mention following what they're doing the widespread misinformation about infertility 
related to COVID-19 vaccines. The extraordinary destructive anti-vaccine propaganda of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Senators who say that COVID vaccines are killing athletes on the playing field, and also a variety of other mis and disinformation. So with those lessons learned, getting back to COVID now, what's the end game looking ahead this year and beyond? Let me explain something that has recently maybe had some misinterpretation of a description of different phases of the pandemic. So let me try and clarify it now. When you look at pandemics, there are five ways of looking at it and what I call different phases. Let's start off with the phase of eradication. Are we going to eradicate COVID-19? I say that's almost impossible. We've only eradicated one human viral pathogen in history, and that is smallpox. And the reason we eradicated it, there was no animal reservoir. It was phenotypically stable. Smallpox from 100 years ago is the same as smallpox 50 years ago and 40 years ago. There was a widely accepted global vaccination campaign. And importantly, the immunity that was induced by either vaccine or infection was lifelong in its durability. The next question, can we eliminate it? That means we don't eradicate it from the world, but you eliminate it from certain regions, for example, the United States. What about that? We've successfully eliminated two important viral pathogens in the United States, polio in 1979 and measles in 2000. How is that possible? Again lack of an animal reservoir, a phenotypically stable virus. Measles from 50 years ago, 60 years ago, is the same as measles that's circulating in parts of the world now. In the United States, we had a widely accepted national vaccination campaign. And again, either vaccine or infection-induced immunity is usually lifelong or close <coughs> to lifelong. So what about SARS? Why do I say it? it's unlikely we will eliminate it? One, there are established animal reservoirs and we know there can be reinfections and reintroductions, although we don't need it. There's enough people that are already infected. But importantly, unlike measles and smallpox and polio, we have already seen the evolution of genotypically and phenotypically diverse variants. The world has experienced five of them already. We in the United States have experienced four. There is, unfortunately, a lack of wide acceptance of safe and effective vaccines with the anti-vax movement. And then, unfortunately, as we've experienced, both vaccine and infection-induced immunity wanes over a period of several months. So what are we hoping for? We're hoping for control, namely get out of the fulminant acute pandemic phase where you have 900,000 infections a day, tens of thousands of hospitalizations, 3,000 deaths per day, and get to a level low enough so that it doesn't disrupt the society, either economically, socially, from the standpoint of what we can do in schools and in jobs. And what I mean by that, some people call it return to normalcy or at least a new normal. Some people refer to it as endemicity. Others describe it by saying something similar to what we see with other viral infections that are present. We don't like them to be present, but they're present, but they don't disrupt society. Things like RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, common cold coronaviruses, parainfluenza, influenza. How do we stay in control? Well, you get it to a low enough level by vaccinating the overwhelming proportion of the population and boosting where necessary. But also you implement common sense hygiene, voluntary masking, 
attention to good ventilation and make available vaccines, antivirals, and monoclonal antibodies. I'll stop with this last slide, going back 14 years to something I wrote with my colleagues in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, in which I briefly described that emerging infectious diseases has been with us since the beginning of civilization, from before the time we could record it. We've seen it in recorded history with diseases like pandemic flu of 1918. We've seen it with three subsequent pandemics of influenza, and we're experiencing it now with COVID-19. And the bottom line is, since these infections are perpetual challenges, we absolutely must be perpetually prepared for the inevitability of another pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, opening remarks. Uh, tons of very good information in there. Um, on Wednesday, you told the Washington Post that the pandemic was in a transitional phase, and you talked a little bit about this in your opening remarks. Uh, from a deceleration of the numbers into hopefully a more controlled phase and endemicity, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, tell us more about what that means, especially for those of us in unmedical schooled uh, environments. Yeah. What do you mean by endemicity? Yeah, well, I tried to uh, uh, already explain it a few minutes ago, but I'll go over it again. <laughs> yes, uh, again, there is the very acute fulminant phase of an outbreak. And the other day when I said we are no longer in that fulminant acute phase, that does not mean that the pandemic is over. Mm -hmm. By no means is it over. We still are experiencing a global pandemic. When you talk about getting it to a level of control, a level of control really is not when you have tens of thousands of hospitalizations and you have a thousand or more, 2,000, 3,000 deaths. It's when you get those levels low enough that it really is not disrupting. You don't overwhelm the hospital. It isn't a fearful threat throughout society, but there are going to be infections in the community. I don't think we're gonna completely eliminate that. And again, you could pick an arbitrary number of how many cases or hospitalizations per 100,000 that would be, but it has to be low enough that it's present, but not disruptive. That's what I mean by some people calling that endemicity, some people calling that return to normality, but it is something that doesn't disrupt or influence profoundly how we interact in society. Okay, thank you. That was that was very helpful. I know that a lot of people are looking out for you know the magic numbers. You know what does that look like? And and you know like you said, it it will be uh, it may not necessarily be a certain threshold or number. Um, does the study published by the CDC in morbidity and mortality indicate the U.S. has reached the herd immunity threshold? Um, if not, when will we get there? Um, is that sooner or later than you expect? Well, I recently wrote a paper a few weeks ago how the concept of how we classically think of herd immunity is likely unattainable in COVID-19. So I think we have to, we have to realize that because herd immunity was the examples that I gave on the slides a few minutes ago when I showed what happens, what we did with measles, what we did with polio. Namely, you had enough immunity in the population with a stable virus that doesn't change. That's classical herd immunity. It makes it very problematic to get herd immunity, which means there's enough um, protection in the community and enough stability of the virus that it doesn't change and enough durability of protection that you essentially don't have any infection in the community similar to what we see now with measles and polio. Measles and polio is all over the world. In some countries, polio less so, but measles is widespread in many other countries. Yet we don't see measles in the United States because A, people are immune to it, and B, the virus doesn't change. We're not seeing that with SARS-CoV-2. We're seeing variants that emerge every few months. We've had alpha, beta, delta, omicron, BA2, BA4, BBA5. So it's very difficult to really 
get a strong classical herd immunity when you have immunity that wanes and a virus that in fact does not uh, stay stable. And you have an anti-vax movement which prevents many of the people from getting vaccinated. So that's what I mean when I described recently, we're not gonna get classical herd immunity with SARS-CoV-2. Okay, let's talk about those variants. So why, why do viruses evolve? You know, At the moment, it seems like the coronavirus is becoming more communicable, but less lethal. Can you talk about why that is? Well, I, you know, generally when viruses uh, propagate rapidly through populations, they tend to adapt themselves to spread more rapidly and not necessarily kill all the hosts. So it's not surprising that you wind up seeing viruses that might be less pathogenic. But remember, less pathogenicity can be due to two factors. One, the virus can be inherently less pathogenic, namely serious, or there's enough baseline immunity in the population that even though you're not protected from infection, you're protected from severity of disease. Now, viruses change and evolve by mutations. Mutations cause amino acid substitutions in important parts of the virus, which interfere or modify their transmissibility or their severity. That's usually due to what we call immunological pressure that's put on the virus. So when a virus infects somebody, your immune system tries hard to eliminate it. The virus that's replicating is trying to escape that attack on it by the immune system. So it tends to mutate and change. When you get enough of that, and then viruses start to recirculate, the new version of it recirculates, and that's called a variant. Okay, thank you. Um, you spoke a little bit about uh, the zoonotic effect in um, the animal reservoir for this particular uh, disease. So uh, how, how have you seen that play out in the United States? Um, can you talk a little bit about infection among animals and have we seen passing back and forth? Yeah, well, we're dealing with it literally yesterday <laughs> when the CDC announced the first case of an H5N1 chicken influenza virus that jumped species from the animal host, the chicken, which is causing a great deal of agricultural problems because it's causing the culling of large numbers of chickens, not to mention wild birds like bald eagles and other uh, uh, singing birds. So that is an animal virus that's jumped species. Years ago, we had a rather significant concern with H5N1, H7N9, which are influenza viruses in animals that jump species. So right here in the United States, interesting you asked that question, we had an announcement yesterday of that by the CDC. Okay, thank you. Um, while the initial version of the vaccines were highly effective, uh, the immunity they produced did not last that long. You, you mentioned that in your opening remarks. Uh, what can we expect from future vaccines? Will they be able to extend immunity and how will they do this? And kind of a schedule can we expect once a year, twice a year, you know, based on the nature of the virus, will there ever be a one and done? Well, I hope there will be, but I'm not overly optimistic about a one and done, particularly when you have a virus that tends to change, which this virus does and it's test us as the variants that we've seen. So. Right now, I would hope that we get to the point where the immunity will last long enough so that you only intermittently would need to be boosted. I don't see the necessity of every four months requiring a booster. I don't think that's feasible and I don't think that's really something that we'll be dealing with. But I do anticipate that given the fact that the immunity does wane and that happens to be characteristic of coronaviruses. I think people don't fully appreciate that prior to the COVID outbreak and prior to SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, we've been dealing with four common cold coronaviruses that account for, you know, variable between five and 
30% of all the common colds that we experience. And we keep getting infected with the same four common cold coronaviruses for decades. So we know from experience with coronaviruses that the protection that follows infection is not particularly durable. And you would expect that being the case, that the protection following vaccines are not going to be durable, which brings us to the second part of your question. We are trying very hard to develop vaccines, different platforms that give a greater degree of durability of immunity. mRNA vaccines are phenomenally good at getting a high degree of efficacy and safety. But we've experienced now that the durability of protection isn't lifelong, for sure. Well, certainly not years long in the, two, in the year and a half that we've experienced it. So we've got to do better. We have very good vaccines, but we've got to get better platforms and immunogens, maybe with adjuvants, that allow us to have a greater durability of protection. Okay. Uh, so the second booster, you know, we're already seeing that that's already approved for uh, those uh, you know, over the age of 50 something. Um, but when are you expecting uh, to see a release for uh, that second booster for adults and also potentially uh, young adults, teenagers? Um, uh, where are you with that? And uh, do you think that the second booster is something that people should consider getting at this point? or should we be waiting for, for something else? All right, two, two elements to your question. The first is, what about approval or eligibility for people younger than 50? As you know, the FDA, together with the CDC, came out with a declaration of eligibility for people 50 years of age or older, particularly those who are even older than that, 65 and older, and certainly with people with underlying conditions. The FDA right now, with their VERBAC, their advisory committee, are looking at and planning what we might have in the fall as we prepare for the cooler season of the fall and winter, which would likely lead to some sort of a surge in cases. So that's being determined right now. And we at the NIH are doing a number of studies to determine what the best boost would be that fourth dose? Should it be a variant specific boost? Should it be a bivalent boost? We have a number of clinical studies that are ongoing now to ask that. So A, we likely will know over the summer when we'll be able to and what we'll be able to boost people with. If you are in that group of 50 or older now, and you have any of a number of underlying conditions, hypertension, obesity, heart disease, diabetes, we recommend that you do get that fourth dose. Okay, great. Um, so masks or no masks, uh, what kind of masks? Can you give us some clear guidance on you know, what we should expect in terms of use of masks going forward? You know, when is it necessary? When is it unnecessary or really not all that effective? Um, if you had to get on a plane tomorrow, uh, would you wear a mask? Well, if I had to get on a plane tomorrow, I would definitely wear a mask. So <laughs> even though, you know, the court order struck down the uh, requirement for masks on planes, I think that if you want to be protected, I mean, in a situation like that, it's a person's own individual choice for the risk that they're willing to take. And each individual is different and they assess their risk. How old are you? Do you have an underlying condition that it would make it more likely that you would have a severe outcome if you got infected? Do you have someone in your household who, if you got infected, even though you had no symptoms, if you went home and infected them, is that someone who is vulnerable, an elderly person, a person with an underlying condition, someone who might be on chemotherapy for cancer, or someone who might have an immune defect? an autoimmune disease on corticosteroids or methotrexate or something like that. If that's the case, you should probably take into consideration seriously wearing a mask, even in indoor settings when masks are not required. If you look at the United States now and the CDC metrics, most of the country is green, which means 
the requirement or the strong recommendation for a mask in indoor settings is not there. As the CDC has said, that could change. And if in fact, a combination of cases, hospitalization and hospital capacity change, the CDC will modify the recommendations. But the wearing of masks right now in indoor cases, you need to take a look at what your risk is and the risk you're willing to take. Okay. Um, I want to jump over and uh, ask a burning question uh, selfishly, but I know many people want to know. Um, I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old. Uh, we're all uh, just kind of continuously scouring the news for answers on when we may see a vaccine that covers under age of five, six months to five years. Um, on Thursday, Moderna announced that it would seek emergency use authorization for the COVID vaccine uh, for young children. Why has it been so difficult to deliver a vaccine that's suitable for toddlers? Well, first of all, I think it's important for the public to understand something very clearly. The FDA cannot act on approving something on an emergency use until A, they get an application from the company for an EUA, and B, they receive all of the information necessary to make that determination and C, they're given ample time to do the very important task of carefully examining and scrutinizing that information so that when they make a determination that an EUA should be granted, that they do so in a way that you can be sure that you're dealing with a safe and effective vaccine. So the FDA is not delaying anything. The FDA needs the information, not all of which has been presented to them yet to make a determination. And I think there's a misinterpretation that they're holding on to data that they should be moving on. That's not the case at all. Uh, can you explain a little bit further uh, though why it, it has been difficult to get, uh, you know, it seemed like it wasn't effective. Uh, the first vaccine that Pfizer had been studying um, was it effective or uh, not to the level that they were looking for? Um, so, you know, it is obviously up to Pfizer to make the determination whether they seek emergency sure. use or not. Uh, but, uh, you know, from your from your vantage point, what happened there? Um, and, you know, what are, what are some of the things that you're seeing uh, companies now do uh, in developing vaccines that may, uh, you know, be more effective in finding a vaccine that works in toddlers? Well, I think we likely will have it. The question is, what is the precise dose and the dose regimen? For Pfizer, they started off with a two-dose vaccine for children in that cohort from six months to two years and then two years to up to five years old. And as it turns out, a two-dose regimen did not meet the criteria that were preset to make it be available to really be evaluated enough for the efficacy for an EUA. And so they then went to the trial on a three-dose regimen, which is what's going on now and the data are being uh, collected and analyzed there. So it's really a question of getting the right dose and the right dose regimen. Um, we continually try to improve on that with newer vaccines, including vaccines for children. And so, uh, you know, with Moderna asking to to seek emergency use authorization, uh, is that a sign that based off of their trials that they are seeing uh, efficacy with this this vaccine at this point? Because I know Pfizer had put forward the request, but then pulled it back. Um, so just kind of curious, uh, what does this really dictate here um, in terms of Moderna's potential success in trials that they're... Well, mo yeah, mo when Moderna submits data to the FDA, they do so under the assumption that the data will be good enough for an EUA. I can't comment on that because I haven't seen the data and I'm not the FDA. So right now, when the FDA gets all the data that they need, they will expeditiously analyze the data and make a determination based on what they do very well is a very careful scrutiny of the safety and efficacy of the data. Okay, great. Thank you. I know we're all hungry for that data. <laughs> um, 
when do you think we'll see a toddler vaccine? Do you think we'll see it this summer or um, potentially later based on what you're hearing? Well, you're asking the same question five different ways. <laughs> and so, I'm telling so, you the answer, and I'm being very consistent with one answer. And that is when the FDA gets the data and the data are in a way where they deem it that is sufficient for an EUA, then they will make that pronouncement. And I certainly am not going to get ahead of the FDA sure. to make any pronouncement about when they're going to do that. They will do that expeditiously as they always do things expeditiously. Sure. Just I just saw a report saying a top FDA official was saying potentially as early as June. So <laughs> well, there we'll you see go. what happens. Go with, there you go. We, go with what the all FDA All right. Says. All right. <laughs> Um, has, has the Omicron variant's infection rate affected or, or convoluted studies being conducted on the toddler age group because it is more infectious? Um, you know, so if, if our vaccines, we're still getting infected, how does that affect something like a trial in children if, if the variants now are more infectious? They're not looking at the same variants that maybe were yeah. less infectious. Well, yeah, we've had Omicron now for a bit. So there has been sufficient information, I believe, in the Omicron era to make a determination as to the efficacy of a vaccine in the Omicron era. Okay, Okay. great. Uh, do you envision a time when a COVID vaccine will be among the early childhood battery of vaccines? You know, I think that really is too, too soon to make any determination on that because we are still now in certain phases of a pandemic and when things stabilize into a steady state, uh, and again, as I said in answer to your previous questions, we don't know when or what level that will be, then I think it will be easier to, determination, to determine if, in fact, you want to make this one of the regular childhood vaccines. But I do not think we can make that determination now. Okay. All right. Um, one of the earlier realizations of the pandemic was that children uh, who contracted the virus did not, for the most part, get as ill as adults. Um, we know now that as many as 75 percent of children have already been infected with coronavirus since the pandemic began. Uh, how is thinking about children and the coronavirus evolved over time? Uh, you know, do we have a clear idea yet about why the virus behaves as it does in children as opposed to adults? No, we don't have a very clear. Uh, explanation of why that's the case. There are certain hypotheses that have not been proven, uh, maybe due to so-called innate immunity that the children have that make it less likely that they get severity of disease. We don't know the answer. So if I surmise, it'll become a soundbite, and that's not good. <laughs> so I won't surmise. Uh, we don't know. Try that. Okay. So having said that, having said that, uh, I think we better be careful uh, and I don't think I know we better be careful about when we say that the virus doesn't affect children as seriously as it affects adults, to then make the conclusion that it's trivial in children. It's not. Many children have been infected, 12 million or so. We've had thousands of hospitalizations. We've had miss uh, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, inflammatory syndrome uh, in children, which leads in many respects to a serious outcome. You know, we've had children die from this. We've had children hospitalized. So although it is true that children in general do not get as severe an outcome as a cohort than do elderly people, we shouldn't underplay the potential seriousness of this in children. Even though the numbers are less, we don't want to be able to then accept that children, it's okay for a child to be infected and get sick. It's not. Okay, great, thank you. Um, vaccination rates among children and young adults remain low. <laughs> uh, what seems to be holding parents back from vaccinating their children? Um, is it you know, misconception that once you've had COVID, you're immune from additional infection, as many kids have gotten COVID already, and or a combination of other factors that may be preventing parents from making that decision to move forward on a vaccine for their kids. You know, I think it's multifaceted. I don't think there's one reason. You know, there are some parents who are inherently anti-vax. 
I mean, no matter what you tell them, they just don't want to get vaccinated themselves or their children. There are others who have understandable concerns about safety. And for those people, you point to the very, very strong safety record that these vaccines have. And sometimes when parents don't have all the information they need to make a decision through no fault of their own, they're a bit concerned, understandable, and sometimes confused about whether or not the risk benefit weighs in favor of the benefit. And I think when you go over all the data and you carefully analyze it in an unbiased way, hopefully parents will come to the conclusion that it certainly is to the benefit of the children to get them vaccinated. Okay. Uh, you've decided not to go to the White House Correspondents uh, Dinner. I'm sorry, I will miss you there on Saturday night. Um, you called it a personal choice. Um, but I think it might be instructive for many of us to hear uh, how you evaluate risk, whether it's you know a big dinner in a ballroom or a gathering with friends and family. What factors do you consider? Well, again, they're personal factors. And I think one person's decision, namely my decision, not to go to an individual social function indoors is based on a number of things that I put into my own personal evaluation of my own risk. And one of the things people need to understand, you shouldn't judge one person's decision to be applicable broadly across the board to others, because each individual person has a number of factors, some of which are obvious, like age, you can't run away from what your age is, but there may be personal risk factors that people don't really want to make public. So you shouldn't question them. You should accept a person's personal decision, which should not influence someone else's personal decision. All right. Uh, what are some of the technologies you've seen deployed to try to prevent the spread? You know, we've seen air filtration systems, ionizers, um, for instance, at the White House Correspondents Dinner, uh, organizers were approached about using um, a UV lighting system that could minimize viral disbursement. Uh, what are your thoughts about these types of technologies? Anything that looks promising to you? Or, uh, you know, is this so far you're just seeing sort of maybe minimal effect from some of these things? Uh, th th that's an unfair question because I really can't evaluate each and every technical thing that puts forth. Anything particular to... that, that stands out to no, you? Well, uh, well, yeah, the one thing is clear, ventilation is really important. And that's the reason why you always say when you have social events, particularly when you're dealing with a uh, number of people congregating and gathering together, outdoors is much better from a safety standpoint than indoors. And if it is going to be indoors, to the extent possible, proper ventilation is something that's very important. Okay. Um, are there any variants you're seeing emerge that are a greater cause for concern, either related to infectious rate or other factors than recent variants like Omicron? Or are we getting to the point where a variant is a variant is a variant, where, that we're seeing a lot of things cropping up? So just your thoughts on that. No, I wouldn't say a variant is a variant is a variant, because if you would have said that, you would have really been knocked on your back with Delta and then followed by getting knocked out again with Omicron. So we have to be careful. There are sublineages, like we're seeing sublineages of Omicron, that may be 20, 25, 30 percent more transmissible, which means it spreads more rapidly, but doesn't necessarily give you any more severity of disease. But we've always got to be on the lookout and very, very careful and vigilant about a variant that might come along that might be different enough that it really seriously evades the protection that you get from vaccination and boosting as well as from prior infection. So you always got to be on your guard for a variant that's different enough that it really causes a significant amount of difficulty. Okay, um, I'm going to ask a few questions from the audience that are coming in. Um, this one comes from Alexander Tin of CBS News. Uh, what does Dr. Fauci make of reports of rebound symptoms in people who finished a course of Paxlovid? Do you think more people should be eligible to receive Paxlovid? All right, two separate questions, a little bit unrelated, but appropriate <laughs> questions and good questions. Uh, there are anecdotal 
st stories, which are what anecdotes are, of people who have taken Paxlovid in the acute phase within three to five days, have done well for a few days, and then when the drug is stopped, they appear to have a rebound, either a rebound in test positivity or a rebound usually of mild symptoms. The drug is still clearly very effective in preventing you from progressing to requiring hospitalization. The 90% efficacy seems to be holding strong. That issue of real or not rebound phenomenon is really being looked at very carefully to determine what the extent of it is, and it is, a, is it a real phenomenon? Because right now, it's still at the level of anecdotal reports. And when you have anecdotal reports, the best thing to do, which is being done, is to put together a study to try and validate or not what those anecdotes are and what to do about it if they are real. That's the answer to the first question. The second question, I and a number of my colleagues, including Dr. Ja, uh, and others in Good morning. Good morning. Well, as you know, yesterday, the President of the United States put forth a formidable package uh, to help the Ukrainians fight for democracy, their democracy, our democracy. Uh, it is strong in terms of what it will do in terms of uh, assisting with security there. Uh, it is strong in terms of what it do to help the economy as well as the humanitarian assistance. I'm very proud of the president. This is such a moment for him where he has brought people together, mobilized uh, uh, the uh, NATO in a strong way, uh, working at a pace that we're all moving together on so many initiatives recognizing the courage of the Ukrainian people. They have said to me, when they're here, they may have more troops, we have more motivation. Our troops have more motivation. So this is historic. And I thank the president uh, for the careful consideration he gave to what would be in the package. Our country and the democracy is well served by this president who had for so many years was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, so he knows the territory, knows the personalities, he knows the possibilities. Uh, for Again, on top of that, as Vice President of the United States, and now as President, he brings his knowledge of the, again, the issues, the intelligence, the personalities, the possibilities. Uh, this is really something very, very important that he has done for democracy, recognizing that a part of Russia's um, goal is to diminish democracy. It's the debate between autocracy and democracy, or more specifically, dictatorship and freedom. Uh, so I'm, I'm, again, we what we hope to do is we were ready with our appropriations committee to start writing as soon as we uh, got the numbers from the Office of Management and Budget and the president's announcement made public and we hope to, as soon as possible, uh, pass that legislation. As we, some of you were here yesterday when we talked about lower cost at the pump, and so we are proceeding with our legislation in terms of uh, stopping the exploitation of the consumer, price gouging, and, and the rest, and Congress, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Maria, uh, Cantwell uh, to have her legislation to do the uh, stabilization in terms of prices and the rest. Uh, the uh, food prices are affected by the cost of fertilizer, cost of fuel and the rest. So all of this is about lowering prices, lowering prices at the pump, lowering prices at the grocery store and putting a very strong watchful eye on the Corporate America, who has a, a business plan in some instances that is about profits at the expense of America's working families, and also about lowering cost uh, prices, lowering wages as they raise prices, increase their profits. The um, so much of what is challenging us now in our economy relates to supply chain, 
When you have lower supply, you have higher cost. And we are so excited about the P Competes Act and how we are moving on that. Yesterday, I met with some of the chairs of the committee uh, to be ready because next week, the, the distinguished leader in the Senate has said that they will be uh, hopefully finishing the motions to instruct next week in the Senate, which will enable us to go uh, to a conference. And we hope to do that as soon as possible. Uh, this competes act is so important because of chips, 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 and semiconductors. You all know that it takes a thousand chips to make a car, two thousand to make an electric car. For example, many other products are dependent on the use of chips, and we have to be making them at home. Supply chain, but that's fifty-two billion dollars in our bill, over forty billion dollars for a supply chain issues and how we support manufacture here at home, bring it home, make it in America, and do so in a way that gives us independence, self-sufficiency for our country uh, so that we have our preeminence uh, in the world in terms of manufacturing and that therefore lowering cost. And a third part of that is education and research and apprenticeships that many more people can participate in how we go forward in this new independent, self-sufficient way for America, where we're not depending on the factors of production from other countries, which um, can be held up, whether we're talking COVID holding it up or you're talking uh, Ukraine holding it up. Uh, for whatever reason, we cannot be dependent. And that, so this legislation is really transformative. Our goal is always to make, make sure people can survive, but we have to do better than that. We want them to succeed in order for that to happen. We have to be transformative in how we have our pol public policy in order to work with the private sector, with the nonprofit sector, with the academic world and the rest uh, to involve many more people uh, in our, our industrial base and and again, in our education uh, to get us to the place where we, we were preeminent uh, decades ago. Other countries copied our model of research and academic uh, excellence. And then um, our jobs went offshore because it was cheaper. And now we're knowing that that was very costly to go offshore. We need to be, come home. So with that, we have quite a full plate. Ukraine, price at the pump, all a part of lowering cost and again, competes to take us to a, a different place. Any questions? Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, a uh, quick question. What do you make of the recent recording that showed that uh, Mr. McCarthy, Minority Leader McCarthy, knew that his, uh, his members were a danger, that there was a danger, and but it's because since then, he has not wanted to punish anybody from all those other men's parties. Yes, sir. But the recording clearly showed that he, he knew that this was a threat. You know, we're here largely as legislators. That's what I love about this place, because we legislate to make law, listen to the people, make laws that meet their needs to improve their lives. What you're talking about, I'm not going to comment on, except to say this. It was interesting to me uh, that the leader talked about the concern that he had, if in fact those were his words, which that's up to you to decide, uh, that he was concerned about uh, his members causing